Sunday and we will be observing two minute silence at 11 o'clock and also it's communion today so we will be partaking of communion. Um, my name is Helen and I'm leading the worship today um, so now let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father please be with us as we think about you Lord in the midst of conflicts in the past and now that are happening now, Lord. Please, please be with those, Lord, who are remembering people who have passed away in wars and, and the people who have passed away recently and be with their families, Lord. In the lovely name of Jesus, Amen. I'm going to read from John chapter 14, verse 27. It says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now let's sing about God's love for us as we sing, give thanks to the Lord.
I've touched the ground. There's lots of actions going on, everybody. Sunday in the whole year that I ever wear a poppy. Does anybody know why I do that this Sunday? Chris, you're wearing one as well. Yeah. Is it because on the battlefield there are poppies? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, back in um, 1914, 18, in the what we call the big great war that happened, uh, when lots of people died in uh, on battlefields in what is Belgium uh, today. Um, there, are, there grew lots of poppies, and so it reminds us of all the different, each poppy represents one person who died, because so many people died at that time in that big war. But today's remembering those who have 
uh, lost their lives in war. Not just back then, uh, but much more recently. People who continue to lose their lives because of war. Not just uh, soldiers uh, and people who fight in wars, but also the uh, innocent victims in different countries. Uh, the people who are made homeless because of war. People who lose uh, loved ones because of war. Because suffering is something that's very sad, it's part of our world, it's not what God wanted. Uh, but today we have a two minute silence at around about 11 o'clock when we just be very quiet and we think about all those people who've lost their lives uh, and continue to be uh, really uh, affected by war today. And we give thanks that we live in a country mostly uh, we don't have to suffer that. Uh, we can give thanks to God for that as well. So it's an opportunity for us to remember that at 11 o'clock. Now the children are going to go out, but before they go out, let's pray for them. In their lovely net, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, please be with the children as they go to their Sunday schools, and may they learn about you and all your love for them, and may they grow up to follow you. In the lovely name of Jesus, Amen. <laughs> Blessed be your name, because God is with us in the hard times and the nice times and the good times. And this song is about us.
my shepherd. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. 
The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. It's a long time since most people fought wars with bows and spears and shields, um, but those words are still very relevant to us, even in a much more advanced age where there are weapons of mass destruction. We are still reminded that the Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress, and he will be exalted among the nations and the earth. And we can be still, even in the midst of a chaotic world full of suffering and violence, and know that God is indeed Lord. Let's pray together now. Loving God, today we remember all those who have died in war. We remember soldiers who have given their lives, suffered physical injury, or witnessed unspeakable horror. We remember all who have lost homes and livelihoods and loved ones because of war. We remember helpless victims whose memory is drowned in an ocean of statistics. But we see your face in the fear of the soldier, in the despair of the victim, in the broken child and the bereaved parent, in the peace campaigner and the reluctant general. Awaken us to fight the battles that avert war. Inspire us to disarm our enemies of hatred. Forgive us for investing in the tools of war. Liberate us from the lust for security. Open our eyes to the true depths of horror in our world that we may, beyond that, see a deeper hope. O oh God, who breaks the rifle, who shatters the missile, and burns the tanks in fire, be exalted among the nations. Be exalted in all the earth. And now we're going to have two minutes of quiet remembrance in the presence of God.
day, Lord God, we remember. Help us never to forget. But help us also to know that you are the God who is our refuge. We can always know your presence with us, even in the deepest darkness. We thank you for the peace that passes all understanding that we have in you. Bring it to those this day that need it most. We thank you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you join me with, with me now in the prayer that's going to appear on the screen. Let's pray this together. <coughs> Almighty Father, you call your children to live as brothers and sisters in love and harmony, and have given your Son to be our Saviour, the Prince of Peace. Grant that we who are called by his name may yield our lives to your service and strive for reconciliation, understanding and peace in all our relationships for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> and leading on from our remembrance today, taking time to remember those who have given their lives um, in war, some of them knowing perhaps what they were going possibly to let themselves in for, others just caught as innocent victims. Today we're going to remember the greatest sacrifice that was ever made, the one who, knowing the choice that he was going to make, and yet at the same time being a completely innocent victim, uh, chose to suffer the most horrendous death imaginable not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually upon our behalf. The one who was betrayed by a close friend, the one who was denied by many of those who had spent the previous three years with him. But it's also an opportunity today for us to remember with a great sense of gratitude and joy that perhaps in many senses for those who lost their lives in war they struggled to find a purpose and a reason why this suffering had to happen but we rejoice in the fact that Jesus of course conquered death and his death was the, force of the supreme purpose that in our sinful, messed up, broken world, sinful human beings like you and I could be reconciled to God, have our sins completely taken away from us and start afresh and anew with a clean slate because of the blood of Jesus that was shed. And that forgiveness is available to each and every one of us. Perhaps today, even if we're very familiar with this and we've taken this act of remembrance many, many occasions, we can afresh just be so thankful to God for what he has done. It's a reminder that our lives are lived not on the base of our goodness and our achievement, but on God's grace. So the invitation today is to come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you're strong, because you know you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like. Come because He loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ 
for we are his body. <coughs> and so the Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper. And he says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, <coughs> gave thanks, and broke it, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, For this is my the new this this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Apostle John reminds us He says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for sins. So Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart with faith and thanksgiving. If this, those who are serving would like to come to the front now, please. So after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink, do this in remembrance of me. And so today we will drink and remember that Christ's blood was shed for each of us and be thankful. And our invitation is that you uh, take the cup and hold on to the cup and wait to drink until everybody is served. And then as a symbol of our unity in Christ, we will drink together. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let's drink and be thankful. Thank you, O oh God, that we can be reconciled to the only one who gives true, lasting peace. Peace in our lives because we are free from the penalty of sin. peace in our relationships with other people that is possible because we have been reconciled to you. And beyond that, peace in the neighbourhoods and communities where we go because you call us to be peacemakers. <coughs> we pray that through that there will be true peace in our nation. We pray for our nation at this difficult time. We pray that the way of peace, the way of reconciliation may be found. We pray for our world 
and those nations where there is such a desperate need for that peace and reconciliation to come. That you would raise up true peacemakers and those who have experienced your inner peace may be able to be those who, in a sense, wage war in the name of peace. Oh God, our Father, we pray for those who we know who desperately need to receive that peace and to know that peace today. Those who are going through difficult circumstances, may they truly know the peace that Jesus Christ alone can bring. We pray as we give thanks in his name. Amen. Amen. Having seen great is thy faithfulness to thank God for everything that he's done for us. Steve now as he comes to bring us your word.
May it touch our hearts so that we leave here changed people. In the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we've been, over the course of the last couple of months, um, on a regular, fairly regular basis, looking at the, some things from the Acts of the Apostles under the theme New and Different. So we just have a look at where we've been so far. This is the last week in that ser this uh, short series. Um, so hopefully the... the uh, yeah, so, so far we've looked at New and Different Community, uh, from Acts 2, seeing the life of the early church, how much they shared together, and the impact that had on people. We've seen the giving, uh, the new and different kind of giving, with um, <coughs> being able to speak healing into the names of people and completely change lives, not just give a few coins. A world view, how uh, Jew and Gentile, those two uh, groups that never seem to, uh, to meet and seem to, to live, completely polar opposite were brought together in the gospel of Christ, a new and different church, uh, and uh, the new and different God that they worshipped, unlike the unknown gods that the pagans uh, worshipped before. And today in our last one we're looking at what we call new and different baptism. And the reading is from Acts chapter 18 and verse 23 through to chapter 9, that should be 19, sorry, uh, 19 and verse 7. And um, I'm going to be reading it, but the words will appear on the screen. If you want to follow it in your Bible, please do so. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. <coughs> this man, John Wesley, was a professor of Greek and logic at Oxford, and an ordained minister in the Church of England. At Oxford, he helped to form what was called the Holy Club. The name was given by the other students because it was people who were meeting together because they were serious about their spiritual lives. Eventually, Wesley was invited by the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel to become a missionary to the Native, Americans in, uh, the Native American Indians in Georgia. 
But he failed miserably. He was forced to return to England where he wrote, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? And on the evening of the 25th of May, 1738, Wesley attended a meeting in Aldersgate Street in London, and he describes how during this meeting, his heart was strangely warmed. Up until this time, Wesley probably knew more theology and was more dedicated than most. But after this experience of his heart being strangely warmed, many hundreds of lives were radically transformed through his ministry because there'd been a missing factor, a missing but absolutely essential factor. Now in our reading today, Apollos arrived in Ephesus sometime after Paul's first visit there. And his preaching had made several converts and he played a significant role in the emergence of the church. He was a learned biblical scholar with a good knowledge of the way and word of God and he knew how to communicate it accurately and passionately. But it seems that even though God was using Apollos, there was a missing factor. His understanding was incomplete. He only knew the baptism of John. And although he taught about Jesus accurately, he only knew of Jesus through the teaching of John the Baptist. And so without in any way embarrassing him publicly, Priscilla and Aquila invite Apollos to their home and instruct him. And in spite of being cultured and well-educated and knowledgeable and experienced, Apollos had the humility and the openness and a hungry and teachable spirit to listen and learn from these people who were tent makers by profession. And the question today is whether in our experience of God there may be a missing but essential factor. Because after his time with Priscilla and Aquila, Apollos is greatly used by God, firstly in Achaia and later in Corinth, where Paul describes his significance uh, in, the, the, in the, the, his role in the early church. And it's important to mention the formation of Apollos in the light of what happens when he's then away in Corinth. Because Paul reaches Ephesus. Uh, there's, uh, you can see it there, Ephesus in the middle, uh, the journey that uh, Paul has been making. Last week we were thinking about him being in Berea, uh, Thessalonica, and then Athens, and then uh, he's gone to Corinth and on to Ephesus. <coughs> he wanted to come here for quite some time. And he promised to return if God willed it. He'd been waiting for God's timing. Now Ephesus was a key city. It was a significant seaport. Um, it was one that connected the Greek and Roman world with Asia Minor. And from there, you could reach the entire province of Asia. Ephesus was also the center of the worship of the Greek goddess of fertility, Artemis. The temple to Artemis was so magnificent that it was considered to be one of the wonders of the ancient world. And when he arrives in that city, he meets some men who Luke calls disciples. But Paul immediately recognises that in them too, there was a missing factor. There was no evidence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They only knew the baptism of John. 
Now, there's been much debate about whether they were already true believers or not. But it certainly seems that they were unaware of the event and significance of Pentecost. They would not progress much be, uh, beyond John the Baptist's teaching about the need for repentance. And so Paul explained about Jesus to them, presumably who he really is, why he'd come, and about the life-changing, history-challenging significance of his crucifixion and resurrection. And then two things happened. Firstly, they were baptised in water. They were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now the baptism of John that they knew had been a baptism of repentance for uh, people called Jewish proselytes. I always struggle to say that word. I want to put too many extra T's in it. Um, Jewish proselytes um, who had, um, they're, they're basically people who had converted from a pagan background to become Jews. They were truly Jews in that sense of being born that way, um, but they had become Jews by conversion. When a Gentile wanted to convert, he had to undergo a ritual washing of purification. And in John's day, the Jewish religious and political system had become corrupt, and so his baptism was a call for Jews to return to true and proper Judaism by showing their repentance, by being baptised in water. And it was also a response to God's call for the nation of Israel to turn from sin in preparation for the coming Messiah. Jesus was baptised himself in this way, in order to identify with that call. But Paul calls on these disciples now to be baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's a call that goes out to all of us too. Why baptism? Water has a particular connection with washing, cleaning, and purifying. It's in a similar way, perhaps, to the fact that a wedding ring is an outward sign that a person is married. Water baptism is an outward demonstration designed by God to identify a person as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It also has um, kind of the, the symbolism, if you like, of a funeral. When someone or something is buried, it's put away, out of sight, not to resurface. And it's an act of faith testifying both to God and people that the person we were before is dead and buried, and when we're baptised, we come out of the water, raised to a new creation in Christ. And people sometimes call this adult baptism, but it's actually not exclusively for adults. It's believer's baptism, it's disciple baptism. It's for people who are able to make a decision for themselves. This is what they want to do. I wonder how many people remember where they were and what they were doing. How many of you remember that today when you first began to hear about the events in New York on the 11th of September 2011? I remember I was ironing in my kitchen Tuesday afternoon in Leicestershire on the radio on. Just happened to put the radio on. There are events that happen in our lives that become marking points in our memory. Some of these moments have little to do with us personally. But there are some marking points that are very personal. When husbands and wives struggle in their marriage, their wedding and their vows will be like an anchor point for them, a reminder that they've made a commitment and uh, 
their need for help to make it through. Their wedding is a marking point in life. See, it's not something magical happens at a wedding, but it does serve as a significant marking point. And baptism is one of those marking points in a person's life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not a turning point. When someone gets married, their love doesn't start that day, hopefully. Weddings are not a turning point in people's love. They're a marking point. Say, from this day forward, I'm with you for eternity. At least that's the intention. Simply getting baptised isn't a turning point. If someone isn't a Christian before being baptised, they're not going to become one because they get baptised. But we all remember who we are. Baptism is about a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Without that, baptism is, is simply just getting wet. And baptism reminds us who we belong to when the going gets tough. In the same way that a wedding is meant to remind a married person who they belong to and are committed to when the going gets tough. So too, baptism reminds us who we belong to and who we're committed to. By being baptised, you're symbolically dying to sin and being raised to a new life. You're no longer living for yourself, but for Jesus. And baptism doesn't celebrate what we've done for God. It celebrates what God has done for us through the cross of Christ and a person's desire to live their whole life as a willing response to that. Like the wedding ring, it draws a mark on the ground between the past and the future. And like the wedding ring, it says, from this day forward, I stand with God, even when the going gets tough. Now in the early days of the church, baptism was a declaration that the, that the believer was deliberately identifying himself or herself with that group of people who were called Christians and were often despised and hated. To be a Christian really meant something. To identify with a Christian meant possibly persecution, maybe even death. It meant probably being ostracized from your family and shunned by your friends. And the one act which was the final declaration of this identification was baptism. As long as you gathered with the Christians, you were tolerated. But once you submitted to baptism, you declared it openly. I belong to this despised often group. A person might be a believer and keep it strictly a secret and so avoid unpleasantness and suffering, but once you submitted to public baptism, you were effectively burning your bridges behind you. And baptism in the, the New Testament involves lots of water. It's not just a little cross on the forehead. Why? Because baptism is an expression with the whole body of the heart's acceptance of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's our Lord from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. <coughs> Baptism gives expression to that. That we transition from death to life, from darkness to light, from hopelessness to hopefulness, from slavery and sin to freedom in God. And perhaps today there's somebody who's been sitting thinking about, well, Maybe I need to be baptised, maybe it's not that important. Can I encourage you, if you've not been baptised by immersion in water, to, to seriously consider that before God? It's not an option that God presents. It's a command that he makes. It's not something we need to do lots of time, just once, that's all. As an expression of our... Commitment. 
our determination to show that we're following Jesus Christ. And the second thing is that it's a command to be uh, Paul, Paul, Paul baptized them in the Holy Spirit as well, not just in water, but he, he, he laid his hands on them and prayed that they might be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We read that as he prayed them, as he placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And that made such a difference. It's very easy to profess faith, to go to church Sunday by Sunday, and yet have little or no experience of God's power and presence in our lives. No life, no fire, no passion, no real deep commitment. Christian living can easily be just about being kind and moral, being nice men and women, rather than living in the timelessly available resources of the Holy Spirit, fully empowered as witnesses of his life and love and, and, and uh, power. Throughout the book of Acts, the experience of the Holy Spirit seems to have been a clearly distinguishable experience not something that was just accepted by faith without being felt in any way. The key thing is that the Spirit has to be experienced, and it's mentioned in the book of Acts of the Apostles again and again. To be filled with the Spirit, to be baptised in the Spirit, and I think the terms are interchangeable, is that um, to be overtaken with his mind, with his heart, with his focus, There'll always be more, uh, more than enough of his spirit available to us if we ask, wanting to fill us. If this to happen, we need to remain open to his renewing. Two of the ways in which the effect of the Holy Spirit is most frequently described in the Bible is fire and living water. On the day of Pentecost, people saw what looked like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of those that were gathered. Fire is something that's very powerful. It has a purifying effect. When you throw damp wood onto a fire, it sizzles as the dampness is extracted. That's the purifying. But eventually the wood catches light itself. Jesus said he would baptise people with the Holy Spirit and with fire to have people catch on fire. On one occasion in the temple, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. <coughs> John adds that that is who those who believed in him were later to receive the Holy Spirit. There's a thirst in every human heart that can't be satisfied by water or by material things. This verse says literally, out of their inmost being will flow rivers of water. So Jesus says, not only will I satisfy your spiritual thirst, then you'll become a source of blessing, a source of life. Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit brings life. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, then the life of the Spirit flows through us to other people so that they too can come and drink if they want to. And the promise is that if anyone thirsts, then when we ask him, God will give us the free gift of the water. Of life. So I want to ask you today as I finish, is there a missing but essential factor in your life? Do you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Or have you not really experienced that for yourself, despite coming to church maybe and having it being religious? Baptism in water. Is God calling you today to seriously consider making that stand if you've never done it before and testifying to him in that way.
Or do you need to be refilled, filled for the first time, refilled with the Holy Spirit? The God who longs to bring good things to his people, longs to bring the water of life. Maybe some of us today need to drink again of that living water to know the power and presence of the Holy Spirit afresh in our lives. If you want someone to, to pray with you, please do find somebody that you know and trust um, to come and pray with you after the service or you want to come and talk to somebody about any of these things um, because they are missing, they can be missing but absolutely essential factors. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that your church was not just and is not just um, a system of beliefs, but it's a testimony to a God who changes lives and changes them for good. And we pray that you'll show us today, Father, whether we have uh, something missing in our experience of you. Maybe we need to be reconnected to you. Maybe we need to receive afresh of your life-giving water. Maybe we need to declare personally our faith in you and declare it publicly before others. Oh, Father, show us what you might want to say to us through what we have heard today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Morning, everyone. The uh, mission prayer this week is for Lucas, and that's actually quite appropriate on Remembrance Sunday when we think of all that um, people have suffered when there's a war zone. We know, of course, the two wars last century were worldwide, pretty much. But um, the people that we give our food to through Lucas are people who have escaped who've travelled uh, to somewhere they don't know, to a country that uh, they're hoping is better and calmer and safer than the one they've left. So thank you to everybody who gave generously at Harvest. Um, I am pleased to report we have heaps of pasta. Um, so please, no more pasta at the moment. We've got eight <laughs> boxes stored before we even give them give out um, and it's lots of churches who've been very generous this harvest and given um, uh, lots of food which we can store uh, so thank you for your donations for harvest and uh, what you trickle in weekly which is very generous the other thing is um, it's good news for Lucas that Catford Salvation Army has asked if they can give us Christmas presents and they've asked for the ages and the different sexes of the children and how many grown-ups we've got. So they're going to be blessed uh, over Christmas by uh, receiving presents donated by Salvation Army. However, they are still asylum seekers and refugees, unable to work, struggling to find somewhere to live. So let's just lift them to God in prayer. <coughs> Lord, thank you that you were on the side of the poor when you sent Jesus into this world. And Lord, as we think of those who we generously give to in Lewisham, parcels of food through Lucas, we are showing the love that Jesus had for those who were poor. We thank you, Lord, that Lucas provides weekly provision for eating, for those who come to, who are referred to us. Lord, we pray for their peace in their hearts. We know, Lord, they're grateful. We pray, Lord, for their situations to be sorted out so that people uh, can find somewhere safe to live 
they can afford it because they have a job. Lord, we ask that the situation of refugees in this country will be improved, and we ask for that compassion to be known and seen and used in our government as it resettles. We thank you in Jesus' name for your love for us. Amen. about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's tea and coffee, uh, and after the service, over there. Yeah. 